Uh, I'm Neil Willey, I'm Professor of Plant Physiology at the University of the West of England in Bristol. I'm part of the Centre for Research in Bioscience at the University of the West of England and I, uh, I lead the research theme in that research centre for plant stress and disease. So uh, in that research theme we look at the effects of uh, the environment on plant growth both in uh, natural and in agricultural ecosystems. So uh, I have a role in uh, helping to lead that research and uh, put together projects about plant diseases and how uh, things like uh, temperature, CO2 change affect plant growth and also how plant contaminants affect plant growth. Well, my research focuses on plants up, plant uptake of pollutants of various sorts because uh, both in natural and agricultural ecosystems biomass quality is really important whether it's for things that are eating plant material in natural ecosystems or whether it's humans uh, eating food that's produced in agricultural systems. Uh, if there are contaminants in the biomass that makes a, a great difference to the consumers and so my research focuses primarily on uh, inorganic pollutants, so metals, cadmium, zinc, nickel, those sorts of things, lead, uh, because those things can be toxic if they reach high concentrations. Uh, but uh, the majority of my research for the last 20 years or more has focused on uh, radioactive pollutants, so particularly the radioisotopes that were uh, emitted into the environment from the Chernobyl disaster and also uh, after Fukushima. But there's a number of other uh, uh, nuclear incidents that have emitted radionuclides into the environment. So we research how plants take up things like cesium, which is very common around uh, uh, Chernobyl and Fukushima. Uh, we research strontium, technetium and selenium, which are very common components of nuclear waste. So some of our research is of interest to um, people that are responsible for building nuclear waste repositories because they need to know where any leakages from repositories might go and so there's a lot of selenium and technetium in nuclear waste so we work with radioisotopes of technetium and selenium to see how they might move up into plants and therefore contaminate biomass and food chains. Plants differ a great deal in their capacity for taking up uh, both uh, inorganic contaminants and uh, radioactive contaminants so if you look at different crop species or in uh, wild ecosystems, you look at all the different uh, diversity of species that occur, uh, each species behaves uh, rather differently. So it's quite tempting to think that if you measure the, the uptake for each species, you will then be able to predict uh, what the flows of contaminants into an ecosystem uh, are. But of course, there are a very large number of species. There's about 420,000 species of flowering plant, for example, so uh, it's very difficult to measure what the uptake might be in all species, especially all species and soil combinations, because uh, there's a significant effect of soil. So you literally just can't measure it. You have to come up with some way of predicting it. So what we've tried to develop over a number of years is uh, a description of how the, the uptake of these uh, toxic elements, metals and radioisotopes, is affected by the evolutionary history of plants so that you can try and predict whether some groups of plants take up more and some less of these contaminants. Um, um, once you get a hold on, on that kind of pattern, you can then use the evolutionary history of plants to try and predict something about the movement of these uh, contaminants up into ecosystems. So we've been able to identify some families of plants that have particularly low or particularly high uptake and uh, we do that with the aim of being able to use what we know about the kind of relationships and evolutionary history of plants to predict the uptake of things like technetium 99 and uh, selenium 75 that uh, you very very rarely find in the environment but if they do occur in the environment we need to be able to predict where they where they might go so there are few measurements of plant uptake for those radioisotopes uh, and technetium 99 is basically a completely anthropogenic radioisotope so there are not that many measurements of it so you have to come up with some kind of framework for predicting it so uh, we use evolutionary history to come to try and predict the uptake of those uh, elements but then everybody wants to know what the effects of the 
the radioisotopes or the toxic metals might be once they get into a, um, into a plant. So quite a lot of our research focuses also on the effects that the radioisotopes might have um, uh, when, when they contaminate a plant. And uh, it, you'd, you'd sort of imagine that we must know a reasonable amount about the effects of radioisotopes on plants because we've had uh, a, a big natural laboratory at Chernobyl and actually there are other places as well there are, where there have been uh, radioactive contamination events. Um, but the data from a place like Chernobyl is actually not as clear cut as many people think and not as clear cut at, actually as even some people in the scientific community might think. And if you look at the sort of data that's been collected from Chernobyl, we've got a lot of data that's been collected under field conditions you know, under the kind of environmental regimes that you get at Chernobyl. Um, but that's been matched by very little uh, research that's been done under controlled laboratory conditions. So there's lots and lots of reports of effects on organisms, including plants, at Chernobyl. But it's actually surprisingly difficult to ascribe that really, really properly to the effects of radioactivity, because lots of other things vary at Chernobyl, and the different parts of the zone have had a different kind of exposure history and so on. And so one of the things that we do is try to match the field experiments with experiments under controlled laboratory conditions. So we contaminate soil at the kind of concentrations uh, and the kind of activity levels of cesium and other things that you get at Chernobyl and try and follow what happens to the plants over uh, many generations under controlled laboratory conditions to try and see, what's, uh, see whether the results from field conditions at Chernobyl and other places kind of hold up under laboratory test conditions if you like. Yeah. And often we find that they don't and you can grow plants in kind of chronic low levels of radioactivity in the, the lab and actually often they're quite happy to, to sit in chronic low levels of radioactivity under laboratory conditions which kind of indicates that although there are effects at, at Chernobyl that correlate with high and low areas of radioactivity that actually in the environment there might be some other factors that are helping to cause the effects that you see, even though they line up along those gradients and things at Chernobyl, but under controlled conditions, those kind of effects don't always hold up.